to teach you some more about uh, From God's Wonderful Word. And I want to share with you about some deep truths uh, that Jesus taught us in the other Beatitudes that are found in Matthew chapter 5. These other Beatitudes start with, you have heard that it was said by them of old times, but I say unto you, this is what Jesus said, but I say unto you, there's six of those, but I say unto you, but I say unto you six times, just like the classical Beatitudes starts with blessed are, blessed are, there's, I believe, nine of those, where there's six of these. And uh, it was, the Lord taught some really deep truths with those, but I say unto you. Here he is teaching his disciples. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, but I say unto you. He was bringing some deeper truths. The other Beatitudes that Jesus taught by Doris Sorrell. When our Lord was up on the earth, he taught so many wonderful things about life and about deeper meanings behind things, including the law, which was just a shadow of good things to come. And so when he said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He was saying that when he came, he brought grace and truth. Moses brought the law, which was just a shadow of good things to come. But when Jesus came, he brought grace and truth and deeper truths. And so he, we know that the law was given to constrain man because without the law, man is capable of anything. And so, but there's other deeper laws that need to be taught. And that's what Jesus came to teach. And that's what he meant by, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Then he tells us, you have heard that it was said by them of old times. This begins our first other beatitude. Thou shall not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So that is a law which was given to men so that they would just not indiscriminately kill each other. And so, but Jesus said what he meant when I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. When we have the Holy Spirit in us, we are constrained from the inside. These, we don't really need a speed limit to tell us not to go 120 miles like the speedometer says. We'll just automatically, because of the Spirit of God that's in us, do the right thing. Now, I'm talking about mature Christians and people that learn who God is. And, and, uh, and there's a different rule. We, 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 we walk to the beat of a different drummer. We serve a different God. And so that's why Jesus said, you've heard that it was said by them of old time, such and such a thing. But I say unto you, he's speaking to his own. He's speaking to the Christian about deeper things, deeper meanings that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So he's telling us about anger and how dangerous it is. Therefore, he said, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there remember that thy brother has aught against thee, 
leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. He's telling us that he is more concerned about the souls of men than the money and sacrifices we can give. He is more concerned about our soul and anger is a gross sin against our soul. Angry without a cause, that is. So when Jesus was teaching us in the other Beatitudes about the danger of unchecked and unwarranted anger, we all have to realize that anger is an emotion that God gave to all of us. It's part of our basis or lowest instincts. And it was given for a reason. It was given as a defense mechanism to protect us from a perceived threat or wrong. It was placed, God placed it in us so that we could control our environment and not allow ourselves to be run roughshod over. Anger, since it is a base instinct, as with all emotions, need to have checks and balances. In itself, anger is not a sin because God gave it to us, but it has to be managed. This is accomplished by the higher faculties of our soul, which are our mind and our will. Our mind, will, and emotions are the three parts of our soulish region. Emotions are base or lower feelings. We have many kinds of emotions. Some of the basic ones are adoration, amusement, anger. We're speaking about anger today. Awe, confusion, contempt, desire, disappointment, fear, interest, and sadness. The problem with emotions is that other emotions can arise from our basic emotions if we are not in control of them. For example, unchecked anger can lead to feelings of hostility, fury, rage, wrath, and resentment, which all will lead to bad decisions and eventually destruction if not checked. Therefore, we cannot afford to live by our emotions or feelings. We cannot allow our emotions or our feelings to run our lives. So the, but I say unto you teaching by Jesus Christ, seems to open up to us some deeper truths. Angry without a cause. That's what our Lord calls unwarranted and unchecked anger. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Here goes that other B attitude. But I say unto you, it says our Lord, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, for no reason, sets himself up to be in danger of the judgment. And Genesis 9 and 6 tells us what the judgment is. This was after the flood, and God gave some commandments and laws to Noah. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So anger is an emotion that the devil will use to steal and to kill and to destroy if you don't deal with it. It is insidious and sneaky. That's why God said, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Number one. Jesus is warning us about the danger and penalty of the unchecked and unwarranted emotion of anger. It has its reason, but it can get off if you let it. 
Don't let it. Number two, he is telling us that the human soul is fragile. And the wounding of another person's soul by unwarranted anger is in no way a like thing to God. In the image of God made he man, every man. We have already been told to be quick to forgive and pray for those who sin against us. And when I look around and I see so many people with, uh, with anger in them, you can see it on their faces, their attitude, it, it, the words that come out of their mouth are just coated with anger. And it's a sad thing. And you just have to pray for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't know they have set their lives on, on a course of destruction. In other words, anger must be dealt with immediately. Certainly, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Anger is an emotion that has the power to take you further than you ever wanted to go and make you pay more than you were ever willing to pay. It is an emotion that you do not want to play with. Here is a classic biblical example of unchecked and unwarranted anger and its insidious potential toward destruction. We find this story in Genesis 4, 1 through 10. It is the very first murder, brother against brother. And it was due to Cain being angry without a cause. We will start our story. We know the story, those of you that know the Bible. The two brothers brought an offering. Abel brought an offering and Cain brought an offering. And we'll go to the next slide, verse five. But unto Cain and his offering, God had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. So God accepted Abel's offering, but he did not accept Cain's because Cain just brought something. Cain just brought of, he didn't bring his best. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. The countenance is your face. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? What's wrong with you? Look at your face. Why is thy countenance fallen? I mean, you can see anger. It works on the inside and the outside. But the Lord tries to reason with Cain. In verse seven, he said, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? You know the rules, just do them. I'm no respecter person. I don't love Abel any more than I love you, but just do the right thing. And then he told him, and if you do not well, sin is lying at the door. Satan is lying at the door. The devil is just waiting for you. And if you don't do well, unto thee shall be his desire. He wants to have you to kill, steal, and destroy, and sift like wheat. But you have the ability, the power to rule over him, is what the Lord is saying in verse 7. I've given you your mind, which I'm trying to reason with now, and your will to not give in to anger or to give in to it. Either way, you have the power not to give into it. So you can rule over this. And verse eight says, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And if you look at this one, you see something in there. It came to pass which mean it, a little time would pass. And so obviously Cain did not do what the Lord said. He did not uh, forgive or, or, or let this thing go. 
He just let this thing stew in him. The insidiousness of unchecked anger. So he let it stay in him and it stewed in him. That's why the Lord said, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Because this thing, this anger in you can turn into something else. For, for Cain and Abel, it turned into murder. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, meaning a period of time passed, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The first murder. Brother against brother. And how much of that is we, are we seeing today behind angry without a cause. We just got a world full of angry people. Oh my gosh. Verse nine. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? So here you see the first smart mouth, the first murderer and the first smart mouth. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said unto him, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the earth. So the penalty of unchecked anger is too great, y'all. It's just too great. No one wins. This was not a win-win situation. We see people, brothers, killing each other out there. One goes to the grave, the other goes to the penitentiary. There's no win-win situation with that. So the Lord, that's why the Lord tells us that unchecked and unwarranted anger is just like murder. It will lead to destruction. Our Lord continues with his warnings about two kinds of words that pour forth out of the mouths of angry people in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, the Lord says, shall be in danger of the council. The term Raka is a Hebrew or Aramaic expression of contempt. It is the same as calling someone vain or empty headed or saying that their life is of no value or worth. Such contemptible language comes out of a heart full of anger and bitterness. Very likely, these were the feelings Cain felt toward his brother Abel before he killed him. So Raka is any expression of contempt. Such words can destroy the human soul and obviously can lead to misunderstandings and destructive outcomes because Jesus said such disgusting speech puts one in danger of the council. The council at that time was two Sanhedrin classes of Jewish high courts consisting of judges made up of Sadducees, Pharisees, and priests. Akin to our Supreme Court, they were rulers over civil, religious, political, and other issues, trying people with positions as high as the king for their wrongdoing. So looks like these kind of words of contempt can get somebody in trouble. <laughs> so in other words, what our Lord was saying is there could be a legal penalty to pay behind some of the words that stem out of anger. A lot of people find themselves in court uh, being tried for murder. It stemmed out of anger. Now for us today, we don't have a Sanhedrin uh, council, but we, every day we witness the destruction such words cause to valuable human lives. We have to be aware of, of the power that words have and not take them lightly. We have seen people speak, just absolutely destroy the lives of little children through these angry words. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life is in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Love what? Death 
or life, whatever you're speaking, you're going to eat the fruit thereof. So be sure that contemptible language is not coming out of your mouth because you will eat the fruit thereof. The second word of anger that spews out of a bitter heart, the Lord says, can put a man in danger of hellfire. In verse 22, he says, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. This speech, according to our Lord, is even worse than saying Raka. Thou fool is causing a fellow human being a moron or a stupid or worthless person. Now, we don't see in our society that maybe this is not so bad, but words like these have the power to destroy a human soul. Just as sure as an arrow to the heart can destroy a body. No one calling themselves a Christian should ever speak such words. Every single human life is, should be seen as valuable to anyone that has the spirit of God abiding in them. Thou fool, moron, stupid, worthless person, Jesus said such malicious words have the power to wound the human soul. A soul that is made in the image of God, heaven forbids such language. I thank God that I keep my mind stayed on Jesus and I cast out every thought and imagination that whatever, and no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. But I'm a mature Christian. But I sure feel compassion for those that don't know how to fight these, uh, these words. We don't have to receive them, but this teaching, that's why Jesus is teaching us about these words, can be destructive. A person using this kind of language, thou fool, moron, stupid, worthless person, against another human being, is just proving that they are not born again. No truly born again person has such contempt for another human being. That's why the Lord said they are in danger of hellfire and they need to be born again. A little clap there for our Lord. Hallelujah. So let us remember our precious Lord and his beautiful words of wisdom and deeper truths that he taught us in the other Beatitudes, as he says, but I say unto thee, <laughs> praise God, give him the glory. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, turn stop. Oh boy.